I'll just stick with water. Here we are. We're live. Welcome to the Learn It All podcast. We are Damon Lemby, CEO of Learn It, Darren Bridget, VP of Product here at Learn It. And today we are joined by Shane Bender. Shane is an expert. Um, he's a CFO and a financial consultant for multiple small businesses. He's, he's an expert when it comes to this field about finances and small businesses. A few um, interesting facts about Shane. He's got his, uh, in 2016, launched Bender CFO Services to help small organizations gain that financial and accounting intelligence to help their strategic growth, get measurable results, ultimately financial success. He's been a controller, a director, a VP of finance in the corporate world. And he has a book, Forecast Your Future, How Small Businesses Exchange Stress and Chaos for Cash and Clarity. Stress and Chaos? Versus cash and clarity sounds pretty good to me. Welcome to the show, Shane. Thanks, Darren and Damon. I definitely appreciate y'all having me on this. Yeah, and I want to and I want to point it. out that uh, Shane <laughs> is our outsourced CFO at Learn It, and I think we worked together for what three years now, four years, something like that. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it's been great. And um, you've been we're all about learning here, and I've learned a great deal from you, Shane. So I'm thrilled to have you on the show today. Yeah, I'm excited to be on it. Well, it's great to have you. Uh, for those of you tuning in, uh, what we hope that you'll learn from this show is if you have a small business, if you're an entrepreneur, or if you're thinking about starting a small business, what are some of the things that you should be paying attention to? What are some of the big mistakes you should watch out for when it comes to managing your finances and the, the financial health of your company? So uh, Shane, I'm going to uh, tee you up with uh, um, this first question, then we'll get into our signature question. But this first question about you is, how did you arrive at at, uh, at where you're at? Can you tell us a little bit more about starting your business, how you got here, and what you do? Uh, thanks, Darren. Well, it, it started really with Impetus started in May of 2015. I, I was working as a VP finance for a marketing firm, and the company at that time wasn't growing at the level that would support a full-time financial person. And so they ended up laying me off. And I remember driving home and just thinking, this is a big pit in my stomach because it's like, I've got four kids, they're ages four to 11. And I was a single income in my family. It wasn't, there wasn't much severance really there. And, and the security of a, of a job was not quite a secure anymore. And that that took me through a journey in 2015 which is probably i had to go through that journey for me to even survive you know entrepreneurship and starting a business so mm -hmm. after that i i spent some time at edward jones i was like okay i'm going to do something different because i had spent my previous 15 years doing finance and accounting corporate type situation i had completely switched to doing like financial advising like per, you know investments and stuff and i don't know if anybody know about edward jones but at the time they're like i'm sitting here with an mba from baylor and you need to go get your suit on and go door to door and knock on these doors at 95 degrees in texas in september and that's what i did i mean i passed all the tests and did all that and i just remember doing this like what am i doing you know and and uh ultimately uh, I realized that that was not really the right fit for me. And so towards the end of 2015, I came across this concept and I really had not heard about it. It's fractional CFO. Like, okay, this is a CFO or a financial advisor, a, a business financial advisor for small businesses. And um, I was like, well, this makes a lot of sense. I had worked for businesses that had gone from 4 million and grew really, really fast and, and, uh, I've worked in the corporate situation and I, it made a lot of sense that you wouldn't want to hire a full-time CFO if you're, I mean, really, if you're a small business. And when I, when I say small business, I say like one to 20 million. You, you're never going to want to hire that full-time CFO. That, that would be like a tremendous burden. And so it's okay, this makes a lot of sense. So I started the firm and I'm like, I, I, I had a certain amount of savings in the bank and I was like, this is going to last me about six months. You know, you know, sometimes I tell people the story and I think that how risky it was. And I was like, well, I mean, I, I knew I could always go back and get a job and do an accounting and finance eventually, you know, it's, but I just uh, didn't, I wanted to see, I do it. And I had to learn a lot. I mean, talk about learn it, learn it all. 
I mean, I was having to learn about business development. I had to learn about marketing. I mean, I, I didn't do that before. All I did was uh, I, I did accounting and I've got my CPA and I did finance and I did the uh, forecast modeling and, and, and financial planning and analysis, all the things that I, I like to do, but I had nothing had to do with, with some of the other areas. And so I, I really had to learn. And ultimately, after about two, three months, got my first client and that made my runway go longer and got second and third. And, and by the first year, I'd pretty much replaced the income that I was making in the corporate world. So it, it was, a uh, it just, it took a while and a lot of uh, education. So that's kind of where I am today. And I've been doing this for the last eight years now for this, this Shane, firm. Shane, did you also write your book at the same time? Yeah. Well, the book came a few years. So I started the firm in January, 2016. And what's interesting about the book is, I decided that the way for, that I learn is, and I, and I is I I learn by almost you know, reading and educating myself, but then almost journaling and writing about it, like yeah, taking yeah. notes. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, here's a good. I, uh, how can I kill two birds with one stone? So I I would do this like weekly vlog, and I'm not a writer either. That's another learning thing. I mean, but I just decided to start writing a weekly blog and it was like whatever I wanted to educate myself on whatever that topic was, I'm going to write about. So that, that occurred. And if you go to my website, vendorcfo.com, I mean, you can see blog. Actually, I don't know if we have the blogs going back to 2016 on there. We may, but uh, we, it was just a ton back in those first few years. And so around 2017 to, or to early 18, I decided to put it in a book and kind of organize them around a certain framework. And, and so that's the, the book was published in the late 2018. I think yeah. that that's, uh, I just that's want to nice. say, Shane, you know, for our listeners, especially, there's a couple things in there. One is I love how you shared how you go about learning and, and retaining. You know, that that's awesome. That's a great takeaway right there. The other thing that you brought up that I've seen others do, and I, and I want to get to do more myself, too, is you write down all this stuff and you and you have, you know, journaling and you have blogs and then converting that. Now more than ever, it's easy to convert something into an ebook and publish it. So for all you out there listening, and then for ourselves too, Darren, what a great tip that was. So thanks for sharing, Shane. Oh yeah, yeah, I really, appreciate it. I double down on that. That's amazing because there's so much research to suggest that this is this is how you learn. You have to take what you learned and you have to put it in your own words in order for you to start to retain it. That's a one level of learning. Uh, so, but for you to turn that into a book is, is taking it to a whole other level. Yeah. I mean, it, it, I obviously had to still have my business and new clients. So I just, I've always been big on consistency. Mm -hmm. And so I would just do a little bit each day, uh, typically earlier in the morning. So I didn't yeah. spend the whole day. I, mean, I know some people go write a book and they go yeah. rent a place somewhere for a week and just write. And that, and that wasn't me. I had to just do a little bit each day. Yeah. And then I'm going to spend a little bit more time on Saturdays and kind of wrapped it up. So. Yeah. Well, I, that's amazing. Uh, I know that we were, we're going to talking about getting into some, some, what you, sh the, the kinds of things that you should pay attention to if you're running a small business. Um, so uh, let's pivot over to that. And Damon, I know you were, you had been, you've been especially excited for this podcast because you, this is, this is one of those things that you pay attention to all the time. Why don't I pass it over to you to ask some of those questions? So before we even get into the financial question, Shane, my question is for somebody out there who either wants to change careers and make a big leap, take a risk like you did, or start your own business, what's the first thing that they should do? Well, you know, it's going to be kind of funny. I don't think that the first thing has to do exactly about finances. It's, it's actually more about your mindset. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I, I actually... I had to, that's where, where I've had to learn a lot about is what is going on in your head and your limiting beliefs around things and, you know, how do you reframe some things? So like, if you're wanting to start, you know, and for me, I had to actually dive in not with not much of a backup plan. I think that sometimes people are like, want to have all these backup plans, but, but you really have to go all in. I know you say that in your book, but you have to go all in. And I mean, you can't be like, oh, I'm going to dabble in this. And, right. and then, and then like, just always think that you're going to go back to this other thing. Now I'm, 
uh, you know, you want to be smart and not like go into big debt or anything. And, and, and but but at the end of the day, you really have to mentally believe you can do this and put that mindset in place. That's kind of the first step. And then putting together. I mean, after that, you sort of have to have a plan, uh, you know, and, and obviously part of your business plan is related to the finances. You know, how are you going to get your customers? What are your what's the what's the way you're going to earn your revenue? Um, the, the people around that hiring contractors, you know, so that the ultimately your business development process. So so all of that's part of your business plan. And then what we do and what I, I like to do is put that into numerical, you know, forecast planning to help you see, does that actually make sense? At what point in time are you going to start making money or you know, how much cash do you need to get this started? And, you know, when would you potentially run out um, or how, how are you going to get it financed? I mean, it depends on the size of your business. Now, my business being a service oriented business didn't require a lot of capital up front. I mean, I, I just needed enough money to pay, pay you know, basically my own uh, bills in, in, in my own life. But, you know, obviously, if you've got a business that, that needs, you know, equipment and you need uh, inventory, that's a different type of capital structure. So you have to kind of think about all that. So, Shane, I got a question for you. So one thing Darren and I talk about this a lot. One thing I love with Learn It is not only am I running and leading a, a small business, but we work with hundreds of different organizations of all sizes. And so we kind of get to see behind the curtain how they lead and how they manage and set vision and everything. Now, you get to do something very similar with your customers on the finance side, right? And, you know, on the accounting finance side. So my question to you is a two, two prong question. Share with us one thing, one of the biggest mistakes, one or two of the biggest mistakes that you see companies, uh, customers or potential customers making on the financial side. And then share one or two things that customers best practices that you see them do as well. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good question. I mean, mistakes especially in smaller businesses. I mean, I guess it happens in all sizes, uh, but the biggest mistake that I see is they just don't even really know where they're at right now. And so like sometimes, especially with smaller businesses, they're just kind of making all these decisions by gut. And so they might not even have financials. I mean, uh, you, you'd be, I mean, I, I see it all the time. It's like, I, I was actually just got a client this week. I was looking at it and looking at the client and, the financials were not not good enough to really do a lot of number. There needs to be some more work on there. Um, you know, so so some of that's just they don't have the financials in place, and sometimes they'll make the mistake of thinking anybody can do that. When in reality, people go to school for years and they get educated on this, and so so you definitely don't want to make the mistake that anybody can do it. Now, obviously, anybody can learn and educate themselves, but. But you, you don't want to be like, oh, I'm just going to like give this to somebody that, you know, can just watch, you know, maybe one YouTube video and here we go. Let's do accounting, you know. So, so there is some education involved. But like another thing is, is and this is probably what you'll see with someone's a little bit more mature. Um, they just don't really understand how they're making like the margins and what they're making. Like they might not know, for example, that they're losing money in some area or with a specific client or a specific product. And so, so they, they may, they may just not have a lot of clarity around that. And so we, we do that through our forecast modeling and, and, and our analysis to kind of understand a little bit more about where are they more or less profitable. And so and that, and that can, that, that feeds a lot of discussions that feeds pricing discussions. It feeds efficiency discussions. Um, it might, might be feeding discussion on whether we even do that service altogether, you know, all those types of things. Um, and so that's, I mean, there's so many different things, obviously cash flow um, is, is another factor, but it's all interrelated. Uh, whether your cash is going up is in or it affects your revenue and how you're currently billing and collecting all, there's so many variables in cash. So usually when we're doing working with a client, we're understanding all the components starting with revenue and expenses, but then we, it leads us into the cash flow discussion so that within we can, we can know better. And, and so to answer your question on what clients do well, obviously when clients have 
first of all, they have good accounting and they have a good forecast and they actually look at how they're doing compared to what they expect that they're doing. Like, so every month or every regular, the, the, the executive team and the management is looking at, okay, well, this is how the month went. This is our revenue and our expenses, our profit. And this is, this is what we expected it to be. Uh, and, and here's the difference. And why was there a difference? And what are we going to do about it? You know, and making those adjustments when those, those types of uh, clients are, are in much better shape to adjust and assess and adjust and make make adjustments earlier uh, before it's too late. A couple of things that uh, does a great answer. Well, let me start with this version. Let's say that you uh, you're in Texas there and you want to start a get a, a taco truck. <clears throat> start a new business, you fall in love with it. It's like, I'm, I'm, I love making tacos. I'm going to get myself a taco truck, go to Dallas. I know everybody loves, loves tr food trucks nowadays. Yeah. There's a leap of faith a little bit with jumping into something like there's always going to be some of that, but what's the right, the right balance? Because I think it's easy for people to go online and like, you know, fill out a little business plan and think, okay, I've done my, my job because it, it, you, you can't become an expert in finances before you start, you, but you need enough so that if you go into that business, there's you, you're not going to start wrong and you'll be able to transition into, OK, we got a little get a little bit more serious about managing our margins and knowing what the forecasts are, because it looks like this could work. Like what's the right what's the right balance there of educating yourself and when, yeah. when do you really need to start paying attention? Maybe it's right away. Maybe I'm, I'm mistaken in my little story there. Well, I mean, obviously, I, part of the reason why I wrote the book, Forecast Your Future, is to provide some education for somebody that could be starting a business, uh, obviously, or they had a business for a while. It's, it's meant to be, provide some education. I think it also helps you know what you don't know. You're like, oh, wait, there's all this that I'm supposed to know. And, yeah. and so at, at some point in time, and I, I can't tell you if I would advise somebody with a taco truck, depends on how much cash flow they have. But, you know, obviously you want to get a good accountant or CPA or somebody up front. Um, now, I usually don't recommend the CFO services. I mean, at some point in time, you know, I'd, I'd love to believe I can help everybody. But there is a point where it's like you're too small, you know, you got to be a certain size where it makes a lot of sense, but you need to get yourself a good accountant, bookkeeper, somebody, you know, whatever you can afford to, yeah. to, to watch that stuff, set up your QuickBooks or don't, yeah. do, get something, get an accounting system. Don't, don't try to do this by pen and paper. And I mean, it's not that hard. Uh, the accounting systems these days are online and not too, not too inexpensive. So get that going. Um, you know, make sure you set up your entity correctly. Uh, maybe you need to talk with an attorney or, uh, you know, I, I, I always recommend an LLC or an S corp for, I mean, I might be going too much in the details or something, but, but for tax purposes, you can, you know, get that set up right so that you can have your, a good plan. Cause you're, you're, you're wanting to this to grow. I'm assuming if you're doing a, a, a new example of a taco truck, you want this to be your income. And I don't know, you know, having a plan and know where you're going to be two one, two years, are you trying to grow this to multiple trucks? Do you want a restaurant one day? Or, or I don't know what your ultimate plan is, or is this a side business where you're just doing this on the weekend and, and you're still working your full-time job? Obviously those make a difference here on what, what I might recommend you do. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? That education. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, one follow-up question just cause you, cause I was thinking about as you're going through this and this can apply whether you have a taco truck or a, a giant business really, which is <clears throat> you can read the financials. We do it, you know, every week at learn it, but it's trying to deduce why when your forecast doesn't match up with the reality and getting into why that's such a challenging place. Um, do you, what do you see with your small business customers and any recommendations on, on that part? Like how, okay, the forecast isn't matching. How do you try to figure out what the problem is? Um, do you have any recommendations for folks? Well, I mean, I, the first step is just, you know, creating that you have to start creating that forecast and you'll get better at it over time. And that's why I, I have a whole section in the book about assess and adjust. And that's, the, that's pretty much what we do on our regular meetings is we're looking at, this is what had actually happened. And if there's a variance, 
then okay i mean and we forecast every single month we, we revise it every single month uh, yeah. so so basically a month ago we thought it was this and we were off and why couldn't we have figured it out just a month ago and so then that would have been like just assessing that and understanding it um i have a, a another uh, marketing company i've worked with some marketing companies and as i mentioned before i i don't know if i mentioned this before but i i spent in the corporate world about nine ten years working with marketing agencies yeah so from about 2005 ultimately that company uh, i was a controller there for a while and then they got acquired and became part of a large uh, actually publicly traded company um, out of the uk and started doing kind of financial planning and analysis there and we, you talk about I mean, that's all we were doing is just analyzing variances of this and variance of that and um, splicing and dicing. And, and then ultimately, uh, after nine years, I left that company. But so so what we would pretty much do regularly is just break that down. It's like, OK, well, if it's a revenue variance. And so now I, I uh, one of the as I was mentioning when I first started, it's like I have a marketing agency I've been working with for for six years happens to be somebody that I used to work with the company that I, back in 2005, he, he went and started his own company and his company's grown really well. And, but you know, we, we would do the analysis for the revenue and be like, how in the world did we think a few weeks ago that the revenue was going to be, I don't know, yeah. say 500,000 and it was yeah. 400,000. Like, how could we be off a hundred thousand? You know, it was just a week. Yeah. Like, and sometimes yeah. it's only like, it was in the middle of the month when we forecast it'd be like it's february uh what's the ninth and, and you do a forecast on well, you know say you do a forecast on february 16th for the mm -hmm. month of february and you're off <laughs> you know you're like you're in the month and 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 that happened and so you try to break it down by client like well what do we do what's the, what's wrong you know what why did we not understand that and you know ultimately you, it def definitely improves your your forecasting because you, you you figure it out piece by piece and the same with with expenses expenses i find that expenses are a little bit easier after a while because it i mean for the most part you, you can start to see the trends i mean you know all the people that you have on payroll you know you know what your monthly contractor expenses are so that gets a little bit easier it's the revenue and the margins gross margins that can be a little bit more difficult and you know we spend a lot of time on analyzing that so it sounds like What's, what's important here is it's great to, that you have numbers, right? You look at the numbers, but what Darren says, it's more important than that is like, well, what are you going to do with this now that you know that? And it sounds like what you're saying, Shane, is that whether you're a small business owner or a mill manager responsible for a, a, a p and is that you got to get curious, right? You got to get curious and be open-minded and, and really looking at what, what you thought was going to happen and, and then understanding what the gap is, what, and what really did happen. Right. And, and kind of yeah. learning from that and trying to adjust. I know as, as we work together, uh, it's really, it's getting curious. It's asking really good questions and, and be able to take feedback saying, Hey, we thought this was going to happen, but um, it didn't. And I know, I think one of the great thing about small business owners is that they are, they get really excited and sometimes are super positive, right? And, but I, I think when it comes to forecasting and budgeting, you also have to be realistic too, right? Wouldn't you say, as far as how things work? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, we can always do lots of different scenarios. I mean, obviously I, I like the premise of having a realistic budget for your revenue and in the, in the expenses so that you're, you're hiring and making decisions on an expense side on a more realistic view, if if you, you you can give your sales team much higher targets, I mean you don't have to give your sales team the targets of of the realistic budget. You give them higher ones, and if you hit those numbers, then it it'll just flow to the bottom line. Your your profits will be much higher. Versus there is a methodology of where you're just expecting your you're always you, you can make any forecast, you can do anything and make it look better if you have more revenue. I mean, if, if you just plug that number in there, you can make yourself look the most profitable. I'm going to have 50% growth this year, you know? And, and the problem is, is that if you build your whole team around 50% and you only grow 30%, then you're probably going to lose money, which is 30% growth is not bad in most situations, but yeah. um, you know, usually people will be patting themselves on the back for 30% revenue growth. Yeah. But 
yeah. but not if your expenses went up 50 percent. so yeah. um you know so you have to kind of taper that expense growth in a way that's uh, reasonable and then you know you can always adjust and that's why we we talk about doing this regularly you don't you're not you know, i mean i don't i don't agree with the philosophy of creating a budget or a forecast in december or january and just that's it and you don't look at it all year it's you you're looking adjust. at it all throughout the year every single month you're doing an analysis and what do we need to adjust here and if your revenue is starting to do better well that's great and you know maybe there's some metrics that you can look at for when you need to start hiring somebody um like to one of the metrics i like to look at is your revenue per person you know so we'll, per account person you know if, if that starts to go up then you may need to hire somebody i mean it depends on the industry yeah. and all these things are, are so if i if i got this right and this seems like an, a really important idea is to um the, there's a difference between forecast and goals you could have goals that you set for the year and you hold on to them all year but you're going to keep adjusting your forecast because if you don't you're going to mismanage your expenses yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, good. And then the, the follow-up question that I had around the forecasting was, um, do, is it always backward looking for you? Like historically, here's what we've seen. And like I did that sort of Bayesian thinking way, like how do you update information? Do you sometimes look out and say, you know, let's say it's my taco truck thing. It's like, well, you know, there's always been a giant festival around this time of year, but I think this year it's not going to be that way because of, you know, the flood that we think is projected to happen. Like, do you, do you account for um, what you think you, you see coming in the near term where you can have a little bit of accuracy around forecasting, or is it always just backward looking historically, this is what's happened. So this is what's we're, what we're forecasting. Well, I mean, I, I'm not too backward looking. I, I, I actually started my career out, out of Baylor the first two years. I was an auditor and I would, I would spend basically go back into the last year. And I, I it, it was all about historical information. And, and I, I use some of that today. I, I, I left after about two years and ultimately went into industry. And what, what I think is more important when, it, so a, a lot about revenue, this is really about how do you forecast your revenue? So if it's a service oriented business, um, such as learn it or anything, you're going to take an understanding of what's in, what's the current existing revenue that you have, you know, yeah. what are your current agreements in place? So you, you, you definitely, ha you should have kind of an understanding of where your, your run rate or, or whatever, where you're headed, you know, as far as your current agreements and what people are typically uh, whether you have a contract or they, they they regularly purchase at that revenue level and then after that you're trying to understand identified prospects so most businesses i mean if they, this would be a very good thing to have is a good kind of crm tool um, salesforce hubspot there's so many of them out there zoho um is some kind of tool to understand what are what's in the pipeline of opportunities and effectively build that into the forecast pro ratum. I actually have a whole, this is also in the book as far as how you can kind of break that out between different probabilities. But, but ultimately you're going to look, you need to have some kind of pipeline. If you don't have a pipeline then that's a red flag. Okay. Well, we obviously need to do a little bit more marketing and business development if your pipeline's small, but then you, you put a prorated portion of that in there. And that helps you trend where you think you're headed. And then, I mean, you, the rest of it's kind of like unidentified. I mean, if you have a goal to hit 5 million this year and your run rate revenue is 3 million and your identified opportunities is 1 million, then mathematically you have a million dollar plug that you don't know where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. And is that the right number? And then that'd be the question is like, can you find a million dollars mm -hmm. that you don't know about today? Is that enough? Do we have enough time this year? Is that, and, and that, those are the kinds of how things that we do to break down revenue to see if it's reasonable going forward. Yeah. Shane, to switch gears, one thing that I think is, you know, most important, you know, my dad, the founder of Learn Walt Lemby would always say cash is king. Without cash, you're out. And I see, especially during, you know, Learn has been through multiple, um, through the dot-com bust, you know, through the great recession, you know, through the beginning of COVID. And I, I really learned 
you know, sometimes a hard way on, on how to manage cash and how to manage your accounts receivable. Um, but during uncertain times, especially, what recommendations can you give to business owners about managing their cash, their AR that, uh, that could benefit them? Yes. I mean, I totally agree. Cash is king. And obviously when you run out of cash, you probably are out of business. And so the, there's so many different things you can do. I mean, sometimes it's as simple as just having good treasury management around the cash. And, and, and these days it's been more about is your, is your cash even earning interest? You know, we've had that happen a lot. Something that's been discussed a lot in the last uh, 12 months, obviously billing your billing process, and, and looking at accounts receivable and collecting, looking at that regularly uh, is, is, is hugely important. Um, you're making sure you're billing in accordance to contracts, uh, your payables process, making sure that you, you want to pay people when, when it's due, you don't need to pay them before it's due, you know, just, just looking, I mean, some of this is just effectively it's accounting 101 and many business owners don't have that. And that's why you bring somebody on your team, um, an accountant or bookkeeper to help you with that, uh, but but that will tremendously help your cash flow. Now, um, if you're in a cash crunch situation, we with clients will do. Sometimes we'll have to break it out by week and and look at cash flow on a weekly standpoint out a few weeks and see what what it looks like. Now, that's usually we're wanting a, a much. We want to get to a point where you're not weekly on cash. You, you always want you don't want to be week to week. So how do you Grow your business to a point where you have some runway there um, for things to go up, up or down, and, and just building that in place. And sometimes that requires a line of credit to be in place. Um, you know, there in the last few years, one of the biggest changes that we've experienced since since COVID is that there was so much cash being uh, brought into the economy through the PPP and the uh, retention credits still still happening and there's the SBA loans were, were really prevalent and all that was influxing so much cash into the economy. And then that's sort of starting to dry up. I mean, uh, people still trying to get retention money, yeah, but, but the other interest rates have risen, inflation's higher. And so all of that is meaning that, you know, sometimes when you have too much cash, you don't, if you aren't doing the things we talked about already, you may actually think you're doing better than you are because you're not, you just look at the bank account, which is, right which which is dangerous uh to just manage your business by the bank account because you may be either pat yourself on the back and you, really the reason why you have so much cash is just uh you, you financed it um or, or whatever there's so many reasons or you're not um, using it you're not and, putting and it you don't yeah you're not well yeah that's another thing is like do you use it and put it into the business and, and help it grow um there's so many methods there to, uh, with cash but like nowadays with because of that that stuff because of the cash from the government drying up um it, i i've seen more and more where businesses are now realizing oh we got to actually monitor this a lot closer we got to cut expenses you know wait we got to cut expenses i mean I, I, sometimes you have to make those decisions to get the margins right i think you know my recommendation that i always give business owners is one and you mentioned this shane is be really uh focused on your accounts receivable you know what's your what's your average turnaround time is your goal net 30 you know may, and and be you know we've been burnt over the years a long long time ago by extending extending that in, in companies and not paying so you just have to be really you got, you got to be on top of your accounts receivable and i think it also it's important to uh with your vendors have a good relationship pay on time but don't be afraid to negotiate payment terms you know um oh, yeah. those are some tricks right there and I also, uh, another thing that I've learned um, over the years is to utilize a credit card, but do your best to pay the credit card off monthly so you don't incur uh, oh, yeah. charges Definitely there. Do that. Use it and pay it off. So those yeah. are those are just a couple of tricks that I've seen as well. Yeah, those, all make, those are all perfect. And yeah, billing, and I mean, so much starts with billing and collections. I mean, I don't know how many times I go into a small business and they're not even billing regularly or something mm -hmm. like that or not billing correctly. And, and just just have somebody uh, do the AR, download it into Excel, and put notes next to each item on why this is, if it's 60 days past due, we should have a 
action. If it's in, if it's past due, it should there should be an action plan. Like, okay, well, if you send an email to them, maybe they didn't even get the invoice. I mean, you'd be surprised how many times, especially when they're emailed, it didn't they didn't even get it, or you know. And so, just having a process of saying, you know, hey, did you get this invoice? You see, you haven't paid. And then ultimately, as it gets older, you have to ask. You know, somebody's got to call them, or you got to talk to somebody on that side to be like, oh, hey, what's going on here? Um, but just regularly looking at that each couple times a month, at least once a month, is hugely important. Yeah, I see too many small business owners who don't pay enough attention to it at all. They just think it's going to happen. And I think just carving out time and, and you know blocking time to go through your AR um, with your accountant or whatever you're doing um, before it's too late, being proactive on that. Yeah. I feel um, pretty inspired to want to be a little more financially literate after this conversation. Uh, um, I mean, I think I got PL down in terms of what it stands for, but EBITDA, I still don't know. If you're advising somebody in terms of uh, who wants to increase their, their financial literacy just as part of their overall business acumen and, and recognizing that this could be, you know, years of intense study, but you also can't think that you're going to get financially literate in like a week. What what's a good place for people to like turn and 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 start building their financial literacy? And like, how much should you invest? How much time and effort to feel like you've you've got a good enough understanding that you can head out into the world with a small business? Well, I mean, I I would suggest anybody find some kind of. I mean, there's a number of different places out there, courses or any education on finance for non-financial people or some, something of that nature that they can educate themselves on just just understanding what's on the profit and loss statement, what's on the balance sheet, mm -hmm. you know, what's a cash flow statement. You know, what it, those types of things are hugely important. If you're wanting to, if you're, if you're a business owner wanting to start a business, definitely getting somebody to help you too is, is important, yeah. but, but understand it. Don't just abdicate this to somebody else to do it. Understand what's happening. Yeah. Um, sometimes I'll talk with business owners and they, they don't just understanding what gross margin and operating margin is and there's differences. And I try, I personally try to tell them and educate that in the process so they know what those metrics are. Yeah. I, I want to piggyback on what you just said there is, yeah, sure. There's a lot of books out there, finance for non-financial people. There's courses, all of that. Um, what I've tried to do over the years, and when you work with somebody like Shane, and for small business owners, now that you could hire virt people virtually and you don't have to have a full-time person, that's why I love having an outsourced accountant or in Shane's situation, the CFO. But I really use it and I highly recommend it as learning in the flow and using it as an opportunity to learn again get curious and ask questions shane and i we have our monthly meeting and i've done this for, for years with other accounts too it's just asking questions not being afraid to ask dumb questions but actually learning along the way because it's it, that could be a great learning opportunity as well I, I I got one one last question, then we'll kind of pivot over into some of those signature questions I I, I mentioned. Um, if somebody gets to that point where they think they're ready to to work with the CFO, you know, you're, you're a couple million dollars or more size company. What do you appreciate from customers when they're working with you? What do you, what makes your job easier? So in other words, if I want to go hire a CFO, how can I make sure that I'm I'm doing I'm managing that relationship the best? Well, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I just, I like when, when business owners are, I mean, curious and ask questions and obviously we want to be able to have regular meetings to go over everything and, and just, just be, you know, responsive and trying to try to figure out how to improve, you know, that that's, that's the most important thing because really it's, I, I want to, my, my goal is to help small businesses increase their income, ease of operations and value of their company. I mean, that, that's kind of a real high level view and, and I can't do that in a silo. So it has to be, a, uh, we're working together, we're collaborating, we're talking about what's going on and what the changes yeah. are. And, you know, we regularly meet this day and age. Most of my meetings are on zoom, just screen yeah. shares. And here you go. Here's the spreadsheet there. You know, different, different business owners like the, the details versus others. But, but yeah. as long as we're collaborating and going through, um, 
then that that's that's really number one. And yeah, it works not, really well. It's, yeah, it's not just like hey, let me hand it to the CFO, you take care of everything, get back to me. But it's a conversation, it's a collaboration, and you're you're you using that curiosity to help improve the value of the company. Yeah, I mean, another thing is, is like when I say collaboration, if there's any financial decision that you're making, sometimes uh, if it, if you feel like it's going to hit affect the P and L or or cash or something, let's talk about it. Like, you know, don't don't yeah. make that decision in a silo. I mean, I'm you yeah. know, we, let's talk about it. Maybe there's some some things that I can help with, um, and so that's uh, helps too. You had such a great recommendation around learning and actually like putting it in your own words and carrying it as far as creating your own book, which is great. Uh, so when it comes to learning, what are you hoping to learn and, and get better at over the next six months? What's something that you would like to learn and improve? Uh, that's a good question. I, I think that probably the biggest area, and it's a real broad subject matter, is just how can I lead better? And, mm -hmm. and I know that's, Broad and and and, so, and that's a, the thing is is that what I'm finding now I have a small team and and I also you know have teenage boys and there's so many different variables for leadership and and it's it's not about just telling somebody something it's asking yeah. the right questions and and really understanding their viewpoint and yeah. and I, I'm starting this book called the Communication Code yeah um, called uh, Communication code. Let's see if I remember it. Jeremy Kubitschek. Anyway, communication code. It's on um, Amazon, and, and, and you know it talks about the different ways you communicate, and like some if, if you're communicating this way and this person communicating that way, then you're not communicating, and it's just yeah. you know yeah. that's all part of leadership. Uh, yeah. Somebody's trying to communicate something that they're celebrating. Hey, I got this, that, and you start critiquing them. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a total uh, mismatch yeah. in communication. So yeah, yeah. so uh, that's an example. Uh, but I, I'm. I've really been trying to do learn a lot better about that. And um, just, and for me, unfortunately it is like you read it and I do a lot of audiobooks. I mean, I just flip through yeah. audiobooks like anything, yeah. but, yeah. but unfortunately it kind of goes in and out, in and out the year, you know, you have to yeah. sort of apply stuff. I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. I can, yeah. I can say I did 50 or no, I've never done 50 audiobooks, but I've, I can say I've done an audiobook every month, but if we don't apply any components of it, it just so. didn't, didn't matter. So well, I, I appreciate that you're interested in leadership. I think that we might be able to get you a deal on a little leadership. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I mean, I, I think we'd be, you know, Shane you might want to call us. We might know uh, somebody, uh, a company could help you with some of your leadership yeah. skills. Yeah. And, and thumbs up for wanting to improve there. One yeah. last question yeah. before I, before we pivot over to how people can get in touch with you and Bender CFO services. Um, we've learned, people have learned a lot, I'm sure, uh, about you and also about, um, business finance, small business finance. What's, uh, what's one thing that people might be surprised to learn about you? Something that people don't necessarily know about Shane that might be a little surprising. Hmm. I should have prepared you for that's the toughest question. Who am I? What were someone be surprised about? Oh goodness, that's a good. I'll question. give you an I'm example. Trying. Our last yeah. guest was a gymnast in college and loves fly fishing. Two things that people don't often know about. Uh, yeah, Mr. Bartlett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't. I mean, I. I don't know if it's that surprising. I, I get well, it's it maybe surprising to you guys. I, I don't know if it's surprising to some people I know, but I, I've always I'm, I really like the weather. I like snow. I like to like I'll go read forecast discussions about this stuff. I'll go onto the National Weather Service and yeah. read about what model said this and model said that. I guess it kind of goes into with forecasting, but it's obviously for the yeah. weather. But yeah. I, I really I can geek out on that stuff. Yeah, and I'm, and I have two two teenage boys that geek out on to the to the next level. They'll, so I don't even do it. Sometimes I'm like looking, and then I'll I'll find some kind of model. It's like you know the North American model said this. And I already knew that. They already knew it like two days ago. So, uh, <laughs> that's that's that well, is that's a good one, Shane. I, I can tell you, I've been here for five years, and I didn't know that you wanted yeah. to be a weather forecaster. But that's yeah, great. yeah. That is a great uh, in a different life. I could have probably been a meteorologist. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Good. good. All right, Shane. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Well, I mean, I, the 
easy. BenderCFO.com is our website. Tons of information on there. Um, we're on LinkedIn. I mean, Shane Bender, uh, the, my, I would probably, I would say Bender CFO. My email is Shane at BenderCFOServices.com. But honestly, if you go to the website, you can book a meeting. You can do all that stuff there. So that's probably and the easiest part. They could probably grab your book just on Amazon. Yeah, the book's on Amazon. There's an mm -hmm. audio book. I didn't yeah. do the audio on that though. I, uh, but, I, but it, but it's, that's yeah, funny. It's all I was, on Amazon. So, uh, so we can find you on LinkedIn, find your website. We'll, we'll LinkedIn. make sure to add all yeah. that to the uh, episode yeah. notes. Yeah. Shane, you're awesome. Not only as a guest today, but I really appreciate all the work that you've done for learn it. You've, you've been great. Um, you've been a great partner with us. Yeah. So thanks again. Oh yeah. Joined working with you and everybody on the team. It's been great. And, jo thanks. and thanks for having me on this podcast. This is fun. I, I, yeah. I like doing it. Yeah. It was a blast. All right. That's it for our episode. Thanks again, Shane. Thanks everybody. See you next time. See you later. See ya.